So RST is a fully automated solar panel cleaning technology. We don't have any moving parts and we're able to control the cleaning remotely. So what that means is that from a cell phone app, you can decide how often you want to clean your solar array. And that's very different than the rest of the industry. Hello and welcome to the Solar Maverick podcast, where solar meets entrepreneurship and experience. I'm your host, Benoit Thangin, so let's get into it. Hi, this is Benoit, your host of the Solar Maverick podcast. I'm really excited on this episode of the podcast to have Matt Casey. He's the owner of RST Clean Tech Solutions. I think this is going to be a great episode, Matt. You know, we've had a lot of great conversations about soiling. I think it would be great. You're a solar veteran or Maverick yourself. Can you talk about what RST Clean Tech Solutions does? And we've actually haven't covered this in the podcast, so I'm excited. This is a new topic, and I know, you know, this is your first podcast interview, so I appreciate you giving us the opportunity to be on the show. Absolutely, Benoit. In so my industry, <laughs> we say, let's start talking dirty. Yes. So. <laughs> we can start dirty. Let's get dirty into it. Well, let's get into it. Yeah, for sure. So RST is a fully automated solar panel cleaning technology. We don't have any moving parts and we're able to control the cleaning remotely. So what that means is that from a cell phone app, you can decide how often you want to clean your solar array. And that's very different than the rest of the industry. I think most of the industry is dominated by some type of manual cleaning or semi-machine interaction where, you know, you go out and clean the system and then you leave. And there's some type of labor involved in that cleaning. RST is fully automated and, you know, you can basically maintain it or run it from a distance. So, you know, what that does is that we're able to isolate the soiling loss on these panels and and really see what the soiling loss is out there. I think some things that we do besides just keeping the solar production up is that we're protecting the panel warranties. And what I mean by that is we're cleaning it one or two at night. So we're not putting any thermal stress on the glass. A lot of these solar panel manufacturers say you've got to clean at the extreme ends of the day or at night. So, you know, if you've got a big system, you're eventually going to be in the middle of the day cleaning it. So there's some exposure to warranties that we're able to get around by doing it in the middle of the night. And I think one of the other things that makes us different is we don't have any people doing this. It's basically eliminating this exposure to your operational expenditures. You know, we have large asset owners coming to us and saying our OPEX budget is blown out of the water. We weren't expecting these increases in labor. So we're able to protect people and asset owners from the OPEX exposure. So between the warranties, increased soil, increased production from your panels and this OPEX exposure, we're bringing this sort of unique approach to the business. It's not a service, which is what's hard for people to understand. We're a capital product. We get installed usually right after a system is installed and we do qualify for the ITC. So that's also I didn't know that. It's a different angle on the business. We started over 10 years ago in Israel, and I think naturally so. This is where a lot of drip irrigation and advanced water filtration started, but we quickly started dominating the market there. And I think this is sort of a preview of later discussion here. In Israel, it's a feed and tariff market. So your compensation for putting in renewable energy or solar is tied to the production that you make. And so systems like RST, which help optimize production, are highly valued. In the US, it's been a bit of a more of an education and long haul because the ITC drives the market. The incentives are in the investment of solar, not necessarily on the production. Yeah, that is really interesting concept. I know we've talked about the PTC before, and obviously the asset owners are trying to maximize production. And you know, I thought it was interesting because on your website you talk about how your solar panels could be producing 30% more energy. I don't know if you know, like, what's sort of the payback period if someone installs RST's capital cleaning product to the panel? Like, how long does it actually take before? And I know it's highly subjective, right? Based on even like what state it is, how much sun you're getting. But is there like an average sort of payback period? You're right. A lot of what drives our value is what we're offsetting 
yes. in terms of power, with the value of the power. A majority of our work right now is in California. Yes. And I should also add, the value is also the avoided cost of all this manual cleaning. But, you know, the payback on new systems where we're qualifying for that ITC and we're in, say, behind the meter applications, let's say 14 cents a kilowatt hour sure. type of pricing, we're getting an extra $40,000 a year out of the system on a megawatt yeah. on fixed tilt, maybe fifty to 60000 more on a tracker. And our payback is starting to push less than a year on new systems. On existing retrofit systems, yeah. where you can't get the ITC on it, it's anywhere between two and three years max. That's pretty amazing. I mean, that's such a like ROI. I think it's a bit of a no-brainer, especially no in brainer. California. However, because it's ITC-driven, people are a little bit in the dark in terms of what they're losing. Yeah. And we can touch on that later. But I think there's a lot of pain and loss out there, but people are unaware of it. So when sure. someone comes in with sort of a disruptive technology, I think there's some skepticism that it's actually doing what it's saying it's doing. Yeah, definitely. I think it would be also helpful for our audience to understand like how many megawatts are being used today with the RST clean tech product. Around the world, we're on over two and a half million panels. But in the U.S., and we've been doing it for about five years here, we're on over 400,000 panels now. I know you mentioned earlier, like, obviously the company in Israel that came up with it. Like, how are you essentially licensing the technology in the U.S.? That's you great. Pull the license. You're yeah. an exclusive license. Essentially. Yeah, we're a sister company to them. They don't own us directly. We have the license for the RST technology in the yeah. US. That is pretty interesting to hear about that. And can you talk about like how you came across this technology and your solar journey? Because you have obviously a lot of years and experience. I know your background is and you're an engineer by trade, right? Is it mechanical? Or? Yeah, mechanical. So uh, it's interesting. Our show is about solar and entrepreneurship. Right. So it'd be great to kind of see like, how you progress from, like, for example, utility scale development and then to creating your, it's been five years. Yeah, I mean, I can start out with a, a fun story. I mean, I was on the border of Algeria on September 11th, graduated college, and I was sort of wondering what to do. And I sort of started hitchhiking around Europe. And Oh, you told me the story. Ended ended up, the yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ended up living with the Bear Bears. And I was on the border of Algeria and everyone was celebrating. Yeah. The Twin Towers falling. And people were saying, this is going to stop the gas pipeline that's going out of Algeria through Morocco to Spain. Yeah. And I was like, wow, the future is going to be about energy yeah. and where energy resources so I came back to the U.S. and started looking for renewable energy jobs. This is like 2002. And all the money was in Europe because they really were pushing policies and so forth, the money, the backing. And I eventually got a job with Airtricity. I was one of the first guys in the U.S. Airtricity eventually built out a couple gigawatts and sold to Clement Renewables. So from there, I jumped and worked for a company doing technical due diligence for GE Finance called EAPC. Eventually jumped back to the next reiteration of Airtricity with a group called Mainstream. And we were doing a lot of large scale utility development down in Chile. I helped open up support that market in its infancy. I think they built at least 600 megawatts down there now. And I started doing utility scale development up here in the US. But I think one of the things I was seeing on the utility scale was that, you know, we were building a lot of these assets and the focus was on building the assets. But, you know, once everything was built, who was operating it? What were we seeing out there? You could see that, you know, as an industry, it's sort of was like the gold rush. Everyone wants to get renewables, but it's sort of like the shit builds up faster than it sinks. Yeah. There's just so much money getting thrown into the industry. And solar is not the same as wind, but it certainly rhymes. And, you know, in many ways, solar is a lot easier to implement than wind. People can get it. You can install it on houses. Yeah. You can install it on rooftops. So for mainstream, I jumped over to Sunworks, where I was a director for Southern California. And that's an EPC. And we were installing a lot of commercial industrial sites. And I was starting to see the sort of same thing that I saw in wind, which is that we're building out this stuff. There's a lot of money coming in, but who's maintaining it? So of all things, my daughter's preschool, my daughter was good friends with this little girl. We're talking about five-year-olds or four-year-olds. Yeah. Her father connected with me and says, hey, this technology is coming in from Israel. Are you interested? 
So it had nothing to do with any connection in the industry whatsoever. <laughs> they flew me down to Chile. I took a look at what RST was doing and I was like, wow, this is going to change the industry. If we're able to eliminate this soiling loss, it's going to be huge. As a mechanical engineer, I love the fact that there were no moving parts. I felt like we could make a big impact. What I didn't appreciate looking back on it is that wind is driven by the PTC and there is a focus on production. Yeah. Again, in solar, it's about the upfront investment. So I've been sitting on my soapbox for years talking about increasing production. And, you know, where can yeah. we get things going? It's been a process. I'm sure it sounds like it. And that's a really interesting story. It's interesting because you never know where an opportunity will come from, you know, from your daughter's friend's father. <laughs> so it's amazing to hear. And obviously, you know, a recurring thing that you keep talking about is the PTC so focused on production where investment tax credit, which is predominantly for solar and PTC for wind is basically the upfront investment. Can you talk about like, if our audience is not familiar, like what is soiling loss and what are you seeing in the market? Yeah, I mean, I'm seeing a lot of pain and neglect and underperformance, I dare say ignorance. But I mean, you know, that's from a high level. You know, soiling loss is basically the production lost from material building up on your solar panel. That material gets in the way of the solar resource hitting your panel. And there's some aspects to this. I should premise this by saying I feel like we're still in second grade when it comes to this stuff. We're learning a lot. And there are people out there like Matt Mullen and at NREL, you got Dr. Valerino over on the East Coast with Solar Unsoiled, and Fraxon is doing some interesting work as well. But we're learning a lot right now around this stuff. In terms of the soiling itself, Dr. Valerino talks about distinction between dirt and persistent soiling. Dirt being stuff that you can sort of wipe off the panel and persistent uh, soiling being stuff that sort of cements on the panel. I might be slaughtering that a little bit in terms of how he wants to frame it. But sure. when we see these charts, like when RST is installed on one inverter's worth of panel, we compare that inverter to the other inverters at site. What we see is this sort of parabolic curve in California. As the season goes on and there's more dirt in the air, the soiling rate, the rate at which dirt gets on the panel, the rate at which production is lost, keeps increasing. So it's sort of like this sort of sure. exponential sort of looking curve. So that we talk a lot about soiling rate in the industry, at least I think about it a lot, because if, for example, you're manually cleaning and you're in conditions in, say, the Central Valley of California, where right now you're pushing over a percent a day loss, a percent a day of soiling rate. That means you clean it 10 days later, you're already losing 10%. So cleaning unto itself is a good thing. But the other question is, how often do you clean and how dirty does it get? Another aspect of soiling is this idea of cementation. On the East Coast, we talk about how organic materials will sort of firm up on the panel. And no matter how much it rains, those materials still stay, stay there. On. So I know Michael Valerino, he had done a study with NREL where they looked at pollen and they were sure. seeing up to 15% losses on the East Coast. Oh, interesting. Just with pollen. Just with pollen or inorganic yeah. materials, which says. So on the West Coast, it's really driven by this dirt on the panel. And what we see is you get these sort of dewy mornings and those serve these sort of humidity events as cementation events. Okay. So when you see this sort of soiling line, you'll see like this sort of smooth curve and then a drop and then a smooth and it'll just keep going up and up and then a drop. And what's happening is humidity events essentially cement the dirt on and then more dirt comes on and then wind pushes the loose dirt off. Sure. But the cemented dirt is still stuck on there. Oh, interesting. So, I mean, the other thing to talk about is, you know, bird excrement and the stuff that gets on there. What we've learned with RST is that during the day, that stuff's really hard, but at night, it's soft. It absorbs the moisture from the air. So if you can actually wash it at yeah. night, you can get it off the panels. We know a lot more about what soiling looks like in California at this point. Build a soiling map, and I know Fraxon is building an AI map. I believe solar and soiled is as well, and we're trying to make them more accurate. But there's interesting stuff, like here in San Diego, we understand that like from the ocean to about a mile inland, mm -hmm. you see around annually 10% losses. And that's from ocean spray, bird yeah. poop, and this stuff. Then, and this is where it gets interesting, about a mile into about 
I don't know, three to four miles in, it gets really clean. And there's sort of like this clean band. Sure. This is where a lot of people live. And if you're in San Diego, you're like, there's no dirt on the panels. However, from that way in, you start getting into Temecula, Escondido, this stuff, the soiling just increases. It's the same in LA, the same in other parts of the state. So you have this clean band along the ocean front. You start getting up into the Central Valley. You know, if you're up in Sacramento, you get that clean air yeah. from the ocean. Then it hits the Sierras and then sort of swirls around. So by the time it gets down to Bakersfield, it's sort of like this catch-all area where, sure. you know, you can see soiling rates in Q2, Q3 of the year approaching 1.5% a day. So there's a lot of variation. And I think to understand, and especially for investors and people looking at this, you got to take this stuff seriously. But we've gathered enough data now that you should at least look at it and understand where you might be. I think what's interesting in the industry is that so much of this is driven by the ITC and this upfront investment. And a lot of these guys are under a lot of pressure to get this stuff financed. So even third-party engineers are under pressure to be optimistic sure. on their O&M assumptions. Uh -huh. And we're not valuing what this loss is. And if we're not valuing what the loss is, then the market's not going to come up with good solutions. So we're in a good path heading towards understanding this more, but we really should be much further along with the amount of investment that's going on in this country. That's amazing. I appreciate you walking through all that. It's the question I had too is when you use the RST product, is there still that you can't remove all the debris or there? I'm sure there's like some stuff that's maybe hard to get off the paddle. Yeah, that's a good um, question. We have this site in Fresno. It's like a place where they process grains mm -hmm. and they put the solar array right next to the railroad tracks where they dump all the grain into the bins. And so you get these massive clouds of flour that float over the solar panels. These guys were losing 70% production and we put our system on and it's still one of the dirtiest sites I've ever seen, but I think we've reduced their losses down to 5%. But point of that story is RST more or less gets all the dirt off the panel, but there's certainly exceptions. Almost all the time, we're able to get it down to about half a percent to a 1% loss. What I mean by that is like, if you look at it, panels at an extreme angle, you can still see a very light haze, but we're able to stay in front of that. So look, when people look at panels and they're like, it's so dirty, there's no way your system, which is basically running on low pressure water, can clean this. But you know, my response is always the same. Like, what did your mom tell you about cleaning your dishes after eating dinner? If you put your dish by the sink and let it sit there for two months, you're going to have to scrub it. But if you wash it right away, you don't give that time for the dirt to cement on the panel. You don't need to scrub it. So I think it's not intuitive to people. They're used to scrubbing. You don't need to scrub. And we've proven this 50 times over. That's really interesting to hear about that. And it's interesting too. I'm surprised like that it hasn't been adopted as quickly as possible, especially when you hear about a lot of projects that are not meeting the production expectations for that. Do you know like why is it more of the education? It's more of a challenge or why you don't think it's as mainstream as some other I mean, I got a lot of theories and I probably will say some scandalous stuff. I think it depends on the type of person who owns the asset, the type of entity. And I have a few case studies I can talk about that might sort of expose sort of the thinking and the shortfalls and how we approach solar. So like the first customer is sort of the commercial industrial customer, which is sort of the bread and butter for RST. There's, I think, around five gigawatts of this type of solar just in California. And the first example is this dairy farmer up in the Central Valley. You know, we approached him and he's like, look, my panels are really dirty. I was sold a bill of goods. The EPC promised me it would offset my bill. It hasn't done that. They promised it to produce and I'm at a loss. And I said, well, I think we can really improve the production at least 15%. He says, no way. I was told every time I clean it, I only see about a 10% jump at most. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, when you look at that 10% jump, what are you looking at? It's like the next day. And he goes, no, I look at it like a couple of weeks later and I see the difference. And I'm like, well, in two weeks, you probably lost already a lot of production because it's already dirty again. So what we did is we just put it on one inverter's worth of panel and compared it real time. And what we saw with that dairy farmer was he was out there washing it with a water truck, just throwing water on oh, okay. it every week. 
And he was basically cementing the dirt on there at around a 10% loss. Yeah. And then as the season goes went by, he would bring someone out there to brush clean it. And so we were able to see like the soil rate kept on getting worse and worse through the season. So I think he cleaned it at least four times, he used his water truck for at least two months, and we still improved the production over that span like 12 and a half percent. There's just a lot of loss in between the cleanings, but that owner was, I think he had to drive by it every day. He saw how clean it was and he just got so pissed off. He's like, okay, we're just gonna install the RST system. But for that CNI customer, that commercial industrial customer, they're just so jaded. They spent a lot of money on their solar and they weren't given what they were promised. So there's a whole swath of people out there that are running their businesses that aren't experts in solar. And they're sort of taken advantage of. I mean, it's essentially, we're selling cars without windshield wipers in this industry, you know? And people expect that when you tell them, we're gonna produce this much and this is what you're gonna get, that's what you get. But it, essentially, we're selling a six pack and giving them five cans. So when you say, why aren't people on top of this? I think that for the CNI customer who's not well versed in solar, I think the discussion starts with the fact that we're selling solar as a cost per watt. That's not a true reflection of the value of solar. The LCOE is. What is your cost versus the amount of production you're going to make? Mm -hmm. If you're just selling on a cost per watt, it's not a reflection of what the value is. Oh, for sure. Of solar. So as an industry, we're not talking about it. And of course, the customers aren't educated and not demanding that accountability to it. So perhaps it's a new technology. Perhaps it's just cost per watt is a lot easier to understand. But I think a lot of people are, they're just not educated. They don't understand what they're losing. And these EPCs that are coming in, they're promising a certain production factor, but customer isn't asking, what's your assumption on the production factor? Yeah. And then if the customer's a little smart, they'll say, I want a production guarantee. And the production guarantee is even a more conservative assumption off the production factor. So, I mean, I was talking to an EPC the other day and I said, aren't you worried about your customers and your production guarantees? Yeah. He goes, I made it so conservative, they'll never ask. And that is what the EPC model is. Yeah. I mean, there are some EPCs that really do care about their customers, obviously, but I think the model mostly is build it and hope your customer never calls you back. And where is that focus on developing a long-term relationship? That's a bit crazy. We have another CNI customer we did early on, came to us, said it's vastly underproducing. Can you help me? We went out there, it's right next to the freeway in LA. So a lot of this sort of black soil from sort of aerosol rubber and exhaust. Uh -huh. We went out there, we put our system on and we only improved at about 15%. But what we noticed was the panels were developing these dirt bands along the bottom of the panels. And I see this, I wanna say 20% of every rooftop I see in LA. This, this is like a disease in the industry. You have these panels, which are at five degree tilt. They didn't put it at 10 degrees, so five degree, you can put more panels on the roof, sure. but no one considered the tilt of the roof itself. So you have like this negative slope on the roof yeah. with five degree tilt panels, and ultimately you're getting panels at like three degrees or two degrees. Sure. And what we know is that because of that lip of the frame on the panel, you actually, at four degrees and less, there's not enough tilt for the dirt to actually go oh, okay. off the panels. Mm -hmm. So what you end up getting are these dirt pans. This is particularly bad in the Central Valley where people are just flush mounting on these sheds at three degrees. These dirt pans, there's something called a drainage clip. Sure. Put a drainage clip on these panels and you can get the dirt off. It sort of improves the tilt angle essentially to get the dirt off. That improved the production on those panels at this site another 10%. I think this is like a, a disease in the industry. We're installing on these roofs. We're not paying attention to the tilt angle. Yeah. And these panels with these dirt bands, they're seeing accelerated degradation. I don't know what the number is, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's double. So that's crazy to me. I've talked to these engineering firms at these conferences. I'm like, are you aware of this issue? No one's ever told us. Yeah. Again, it goes back to this idea, build, build, build. Yeah. Where's the feedback loop on production? <laughs> Who's talking about if what you designed actually worked well? Sure. That's crazy to me. You were asked originally, why aren't people asking these questions? I think we're learning as we go. We're just sure. needing to get as much of this built out as fast as we can. 
I sit back and think about the taxpayer on this stuff, and I'm thinking, taxpayers should be furious. Oh, yeah. As American citizens, we're paying taxes, but we're paying taxes for renewable energy. That's not what the incentive is set up for. Yeah. It's set up to just get the stuff so installed. Well, and whatever the investment amount is, not right. necessarily building the most efficient and productive system, right? Which the PTC allows because people want to maximize. Right. But if you're a serious asset owner, like a large owner of assets, you've got the resources for your own M team. If you gain that information, you're not going to share it with the industry. That's a competitive yeah. advantage. Why would you share that? But if you know what you're doing, the PTC probably, I know the big guys are really looking at it. It's probably going to come from the top down from the big stuff and move down eventually. But I don't know if in the CNI space, they're going to be smart enough or sophisticated. It's not smart enough. Are they sophisticated enough to be able to make those assessments? For sure. There's some other things at play. I mean, we talked about third-party engineers being under pressure to be optimistic on their own M assumptions, their yeah. forecasts. I think a lot of these financiers, these PPA providers, they get pulled into those assumptions and they're not getting the returns that they expected. We just did a pilot with a large PPA provider. Told me there's no way you're going to see more than a 6% annual improvement. No way. I've been doing this for yeah. 10 years. I'm an old dog in the industry. I said, dude, we're definitely going to improve it over 15%. Yeah. We are currently above 40% improvement at that site as a moment in time right uh, now. A quick question, like how often is RST cleaning the paddles? Right. It depends on the time of year. Yeah. In Q1, typically once a week. And, you know, to follow sort of irrigation laws in California, we have a program that basically, if it rains, we don't clean. Q2, Q3, as we start seeing soiling rates increase, we are recommending two to three times a week. In Q4, sometimes it's every day. It really depends on the soiling rate at where you're at. I will say that like, if your system's on the ground, you're usually seeing double the soiling rate as stuff that's up on roofs. Yeah, for sure. And then your typical customer is more the asset owner. Is that who you're usually directly contracting with to provide your services to? Right, because they're the only ones that are really interested in the production. Yeah. But unfortunately, it's coming after everything's already been done. Yeah. It's not being asked at the beginning. At the beginning, for sure. That definitely changes things. And can you talk more about how the industry can improve? You know, obviously, the industry is growing exponentially. It will continue to even grow more exponentially. There's obviously headwinds as well related to the election, related to interconnection permitting challenges and the invest also IRA in the sense of getting clear guidance and domestic manufacturing since you've been on the solar roller coaster for a while like how as an industry can we improve because I feel like this is just an important aspect of it meaning that if we can increase production or better production right mm -hmm. it, it'll make a huge difference because I think always the developers are optimistic on the production expectation. Mm -hmm. yeah, the, the investor is the one who's got to actually meet those expectations for regarding production. So I guess like just to make a long story short is like, who's your typical customer mm -hmm. and what are some of the ways the, the industry can improve? Yeah, I'll answer your second question first. Yeah. In terms of like how we can improve, I mean, Obviously, we need to incentivize the production, not the investment. Sure. There's a lot of ways you can do that. The first thing I think about is creating accountability. So it really interests me. When we talk about the industry improvement, we don't need to talk about just about soiling. We can talk yeah. about optimization as a whole. Sure. Like the O&M industry, in my opinion, is vastly under-resourced. Yeah. And the model for most assets is let's react to when something happens oh, sure. as opposed to being preventative. So what can we do as an optimization industry to improve? That accountability is a first step. Like companies like Zeitview, which did a bunch of thermal scans. I think they did a thermal scan of every solar project in California that was over one megawatt. Yeah. Like it would be great if that stuff was in the public sphere. For sure. Because now you can point to who did the projects yeah. and who's actually operating them well. But another way is sharing data. I was on the phone with the chief of staff to one of the commissioners to the CPUC, the California oh, okay. Public Utility Commission. For sure. She was asking the same question yesterday 
I'm like, why don't you set up an incentive program for people to share their operational data, their inverter data? Oh my gosh. Why don't we yeah, start doing an assessment mm -hmm. of what's going on in the industry? And then people can then say, holy crap, my asset, you know, my solar rate in this area of the state of California, yeah. for example, is in the lower percentile. Sure. Why? Like, let's start getting accountability, some standards around what performance is. That's a good start. Incentives are a big thing. I think from a taxpayer's mm -hmm. perspective, RST is like, we're at a nickel on the dollar compared to putting in more solar. In terms of the taxpayer's investment, for in terms of the ITC, allow the ITC to be retroactive optimization assets yeah. they are technologies. Encourage new technologies to go out there, give them incentives to actually optimize assets. Yeah. That would be huge. That would create a market that we don't have right now. Oh, for sure. That's a big thing we can do in terms of creating incentives. Another thing is financing. Mm -hmm. Like if we're able to improve production on a system and say we're able to improve it 50,000 bucks, but we're able to get access to low interest financing yeah. where someone can buy our system as a capital product and it only needs to pay 20,000 bucks a year, they're cash flow positive yeah. year one. We could even do that for O&M services, on it, but we need to quantify what preventative maintenance will do for us. For sure. One thing's for sure, if you're not taking care of your inverters and your inverter goes out yeah. and your system's down for three to six months waiting for an inverter to come in, that's a lot of loss. Oh, for sure. So are there ways that we can incentivize people that way? There's a lot of low hanging fruit here. So, I mean, you asked the second part of your question, who are the customers? The lowest hanging fruit are the people that are just in the dark around yeah. production because they're focused on their own businesses or even on the residential side. I mean, how many solar sales guys have said, your system's maintenance free, give me a break. <laughs> if you never needed to clean your panels, then why do we have car washes for cars? Yeah. These group of people are the ones that are really losing a lot from their investment. Oh, for sure. They didn't know the right questions to ask. They didn't have the details or what have you, but they're probably not getting the return on investment that they expected. Sure. And we're seeing that all over California. There's people who are extremely jaded around solar. It just hasn't done what people promised. This is one of the things we can do to help them. Larger asset owners, portfolio owners, they're also a huge customer. Sure. So... Even utility scale stuff for what RST does, we can put it around the edges of the array where it's the dirtiest. We don't have to do the whole thing. But, you know, those guys know where the numbers are. If you're running a large asset, you might have the resources to understand what you're losing, but you're not sharing it because it's a competitive advantage. I think there's a lot of love to be had in this industry, but we need to incentivize people to focus on production. We're just not there as an industry. It's like a slaughterhouse out there. That's actually a good point. The data is so important, but... And if we all had all this public, all this data of all the solar systems above one megawatt mm -hmm. in California, I'm sure people could basically create a solution to increase production for a lot of different, you know, just from having that data. And so it's interesting. There's even broader implications to this. For example, interconnection agreements. Yeah. You know, the way the utility works is that they look at the worst case scenario for their grid, <laughs> middle of summer at the solstice. Yeah. And then they say well, that capacity needs to be tied up on our line. But if you're underproducing on that line, you're just taking up line space yeah, for, for sure. other solar. Or for example, you're not taking care of your inverters. Yeah. Inverters go out, you don't have an easy solution. Now for the grid operator, you're seeing this unpredictable pattern in production in solar that has real implications for resource adequacy. If we were on top of it, if we could provide more predictable production for the utility, yeah. then we're actually helping up free more space on the grid. So it matters that we take care of our solar and look at the production. It just feels like the scales have been tilted the wrong direction. The focus is just getting it on right now. Yeah. I mean, that's actually a, goes to another point that we talked about in the pre-interview, how you know, a lot of the developers or EPCs are not owning the projects. They're essentially you know, flipping it to the long-term asset owner. So like interests are not necessarily aligned, right? Yeah. They're you know, trying to build the cheapest system yeah. that they can <laughs> to maximize that market. It is weird behavior. Look, there's a great conference, the Solar Asset Management 
Conference North America, SAMNA. It's here in San Diego every year, I think. Solar Plaza, yeah. Solar Plaza. Plaza. I love going to their underperformance. There was a lady who filled in this year. I didn't get her name, but she was in finance. And it was hilarious. It's sad. She said, look, when I'm looking at a job or I'm looking at a solar asset from a financial perspective, I can tell within 30 seconds if the project is going to be flipped or owned based on their assumptions around ONM. The previous year at that same session, it's one of those deals where you can submit a question and it shows up on the board. And then the person that has the best question gets upvoted. And then they ask the top question. The top question at the underperformance panel was, what is your view on having two models, one used for financing and the other one that realistically reflects O&M costs? What are we doing? (laughs) What are we talking about? Like, why would there be a difference? The answer is it's driven by the ITC and these upfront incentives. Yeah. People know what's going on, sure. but we're playing two games. Yeah. One that's realistic and one that's for the financing. And who's accepting these numbers? You know, the truth is there's just a ton of money coming into the country. There's a lot of people that want to get in the market. The U.S. is a stable market. There's high quality off takers, counterparties. Oh, counterparties, yeah. Sort of the question is, when are we going to grow up? When are we going to be a mature market in this regard? Yeah. Right now, it's like the Wild West and we're in second grade. Yeah, I mean, it's still early. I believe in the whole energy transition. Yeah. I mean, solar in itself, I mean, especially with the IRA really getting impacted. Meaning, like, we've been waiting two years for a lot of guidance on things. Right. So it'll be amazing to see, you know, how much solar comes online. But then also, it's the asset owners, right, who have to hire third-party O&M and figure out how to, using your technology, and there's a lot of other innovation that's happening, too, as well. It's because what we're seeing is that the projects are underperforming the majority of time based on what the initial estimates are. Right. And obviously this is a great way of throwing your technology to limit uh, production losses or decrease of the amount of production. Look at your soil loss on your PV cyst yeah. or whatever. At least in California, it is your single largest thing that yeah. will create. That is a loss. It is a low hanging fruit. It's one of the easiest things we can do. We have a technology proven over and over again that oh, works. Yeah. So, Absolutely. Yeah. We got to go. Yeah, definitely. And I'm excited that you're trying to educate the solar community and industry about your product, about soil and losses. Mm. And I know it's not easy because everyone's just comfortable with doing what's been just done before and to bring something new and innovative. There's usually, as you mentioned earlier, some hesitation related to it. You're right. We have to educate. And we need to show people what they're really losing. It's a process. It's definitely going to take some time. And just to switch topics here, Matt has also organizes a happy hour in Southern California, usually around the Los Angeles area. Can you talk about how that happened? You know, I've been to now two of those events. And it's uh, like a great network of people. A lot of people have been actually in the industry for a very long time. Mm-hmm. And there's great turnouts for that event. Like how... Did that happen? And this is sort of like old school. You have sponsors too. Yeah, we do. We have like a whole line of sponsors <laughs> yeah, for, for the event as well. And these are real companies. Energy Toolbase was the last sponsor yeah. of the event. And then you had it at the headquarters of, uh, I'm trying to remember it, the EPC residence. True Public? Yeah, True Public. Yeah. Back in May. Sorry, that was May. Yeah, we try to do it every three months. Yeah. And we try to keep it like old school industry style, which means like no speeches. Like we're there to have a drink, talk some good stories and get together. And, you know, L.A. is like this really interesting place because it doesn't seem like there's big renewable energy companies that are based here. But people, they all have people here. Yeah. So the amount of people that come out of the woodwork doing interesting things is fascinating. Like even after 20 years being in the industry, I always leave the cocktail hour feeling like I've learned something new and interesting. Oh, for sure. We started it maybe 10 years ago. Yeah. The guy named Chad Taddy, he was working for Suzlon wind turbines at the time. Uh-huh. And we just started getting guys together. It was only like 10 of us. I mean, now we've got like a email list of 600 people now and it's just become one of those things that we've been doing 
every three months and it's been a blast. Yeah. So, I mean, if people are interested to get on the mailing list, just send me an email. I'll put it on the mailing list. And the next cocktail hour will be in early to mid November. That's great to know. And then, you know, I'm actually interested in getting your perspective on the California market. You know, I think there's like mixed emotions in California. You had, you know, NEM two to NEM three happen. Right. March of 2023. Then recently there was no to like the community solar legislation, right. which is seven gigawatts. I don't know if you saw it two weeks ago, California talked about how we're going to need all this solar and storage and other technologies to be able to meet their clean energy goals. It seems like from my understanding that it's more of like utility scale solar and storage or standalone storage it would be great to like to get your perspective of the california market obviously it's mm-hmm. been the most progressive state for solar and mm-hmm. usually the top state for solar i think this year now last year was texas it seems like things have changed in the state but still there's a lot of opportunity i believe mm-hmm. even with some of the recent sort of challenges right jeez man i'm down in the fire getting this company going that I wish I was yeah. looking, you know, had the space to sort of think about this from a broad perspective. Yeah. I mean, what I know is that we're not going to meet our goals. Oh, yes, that's right. As you pointed out. Yeah. And we're going to have to come up with creative things. Your product is perfect. It's probably the cheapest thing on the dollar. Yeah. Probably increase production in the state by... I mean, if we're just looking at the CNI space yeah. and we can improve it 10%, it's another half gig. It's already there. Yeah, We're going to have to come up with some creative solutions. I think it's a, an amazing time to think creatively, to think in new ways. You know, looking at dynamic loading on the lines, these yeah. types of things where you can be a little bit more sophisticated, how you look at solar and wind for that matter. But I don't have any real insights here. I mean, yeah. I think we are at this sort of interesting juncture where we have to come up with some new creative approaches. The first one is what you're doing, right, with RST Capital. It's a lot easier to add, right, to an existing project than building a new project. Obviously, increase the utilization of the solar PV. Right. So, yeah, I mean, look, the utility has been so focused on efficiencies around the demand side. Yeah. That what are we doing around efficiencies on the supply supply side? side, It's a low-hanging fruit. Yeah, this has been an amazing interview, Matt. I appreciate you making time out of your busy schedule to talk about this. If people wanted to learn more about RST or even the happy hours, like what's the best way for them to reach out to you? They can reach out to me by email. It's definitely the easiest way. Sure. Should I say my email address here? Yeah, you can say that. Then we'll as well put it on the notes of the podcast. Sure. My email address is Matthew, M-A-T-T-H-E-W, at R-S-T hyphen cleantech. That's C-L-E-A-N-T-E-C-H dot com. Love to have the conversation. I want to be part of this revolution on the education of operating these assets. It's not just me. It's O&M providers. It's other people that are trying to help optimize these assets. This is a great time to get this conversation going. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. (laughs) So yeah, please reach out if you want to be on the cocktail hour as well. Get you on the list. Love to meet up. Yeah, and I appreciate you doing this because like really we need someone to educate the community. Mm -hmm. And this is low-hanging fruit, as you said, with the soiling losses and improving it. It's a capital product, right? Not like you don't need labor and things like that. And I'm sure you have a lot of analysis showing how much someone can save have your technology on their system right so uh, the data is there we've done the case studies now the question is are you willing to believe it (laughs) (laughs) well thank you again matt and yeah hopefully we'll speak to you soon and good luck with uh, everything that you're working on and thank you benoy for being such a maverick and getting to it oh yes and you're a maverick as well almost 20 years of experience in renewables. I appreciate you putting the good fight and obviously it's a roller coaster and obviously having your own business for five years and you're having a positive impact. So keep up the good work. Thanks, Benoit. Oh, anytime. 
Thanks for listening to the Solar Maverick Podcast. The Solar Maverick Podcast is brought to you by Renew Energy. We're a solar development and consulting firm. If you believe that this podcast is adding value to you, please give us a five-star review and share with those that you think could benefit from this information. Please email all questions, suggestions, and feedback to info at renewenergy.com. That's I-N-F-O at R-E-N-E-U energy.com. The Solar Maverick podcast is produced by Podcast Laundry and executive produced by Benoit Thangin and Kevin Y. Brown. <laughs>